Welcome to our lesson on collaboration with collateral resources. This lesson is composed of watching this video and then completing the quiz with a passing score of at least 70%. A copy of the PowerPoint slideshow from this video is available in the lesson media section of this lesson. The simple dictionary definitions of collaboration include a process of two or more people or organizations working together to complete a task or achieve a goal, the action of working with someone to produce or create something, or two or more people working together towards shared goals. However, collaboration is an intricate concept with many attributes and has been defined in a variety of ways. The attributes included in collaboration are sharing of planning, making decisions, solving problems, setting goals, assuming responsibility, working together cooperatively, communicating, and coordinating openly. Related concepts such as cooperation joint practice and collegiality are often used as substitutes for collaboration. However, a more robust definition of collaboration might be the following. Collaboration is both a process and an outcome in which shared interest or conflict that cannot be addressed by any single individual is addressed by key stakeholders. A key stakeholder is any party directly influenced by the actions others take to solve a complex problem. The collaborative process involves a synthesis of different perspectives to better understand complex problems. A collaborative outcome is the development of integrative solutions that go beyond an individual's vision to a productive resolution that could not be accomplished by any single person or organization. This training is about collaboration with collabor collateral resources. Now that we have a definition of collaboration, what do we mean by collateral resources? Simply put, a collateral resource is someone other than the person we are serving who is involved in that person's life. These other people include the person's family and friends. Regarding family, I do want to make sure that we include what is called the person's family of choice or those individuals that the person views as being his or her family. Collateral resources include other individuals in the community who are supportive of the person we are serving. It could be some type of formal support group uh, or an organization like a clubhouse, uh, but it can also include the person's informal supports like a church group or a group of folks that get together regularly. We need to make sure that we include the person's employer as a significant person in their life. Employment, whether paid or volunteer, plays such a crucial role in everyone's life that we must look to add that person to our team. Next would be a representative that provides housing services to the person. It could be a landlord or some type of housing organization. After family and employment, housing may be the most important factor in a person's success at meeting their goals. Next, we need to consider whether the person is involved in a faith community, and if so, attempt to identify someone from that community that supports the person we are serving. Next, we want to identify what kinds of activities in the community that the person we are serving is involved in. It might be a bowling league or a softball team, a card club or a book club people gain a great deal of support in their lives from the activities that they do. So we want to include someone from that aspect of a person's life. And finally, we need to be engaged with other professionals that are providing services to the person 
that we are serving. Whether that person is a doctor or a nurse, a lawyer, a probation officer, any other professional who is providing services needs to be included in our team of collaboration. Far too often we allow our concerns about the confidentiality of the professional relationship that we have with the person to limit our outreach into the community. Certainly, because the service that we provide is confidential, we want to obtain releases of information for anyone with whom we wish to collaborate. But remember, it is the person that we are serving that defines who the important people in his or her life are. And it is the person that we are serving who decides who the team members should be. Sometimes individuals with whom we are working are hesitant to involve anyone outside the service provider in their services. It is possible that they are hesitant because they've never been asked before, or they could fear what the other person may think if they learn that they are receiving services. Regardless, it is critical in case management services to discuss with the person we are serving the importance of being able to collaborate with other important people in their life. Feel free to use one of my favorite metaphors. A baseball team is not made up of just a pitcher and a catcher. There are seven other people on the field who figuratively and sometimes literally have the pitcher's back. All of us need others on our team. And when we are working with a person, we want to be able to work with the entire team. And finally, I won't necessarily say, don't take no for an answer, but don't take no for an answer. If the person you're working with is hesitant to build a collaborative team around them, continue to discuss this possibility with the person you're serving. They may initially be hesitant, sometimes because they really don't know us that well. But as we build our relationship with the person, he or she may become more open to including others in their services. Once the person we are serving has identified the people that he or she wants on the team, we need to remember several things about building an effective team. First, we want to recognize, appreciate, respect, and value the expertise of the others that are on the team. Remember that the person served is the expert on his or her own life, and certainly the family knows the person better than we do. At no time during the collaborative process should we find ourselves taking the expert position. Second, we want to make sure that we understand the roles and responsibilities of all of the members on the team. We need to clarify the relationship between the person served and the team member and arrive at an agreement about what responsibilities each person will accept. Third, we want to recognize the limits of our own knowledge and look to team members for assistance. The entire purpose of collaboration is to provide better service than we can provide by ourselves, so we will need the help of the team. Fourth, we want to demonstrate effective leadership of the team by directing its work, guiding, and influencing them. While the person served actually identifies the team members, to extend my earlier metaphor, we are the team manager, and it is our skill in working with the team that will determine its success. Fifth, we want to respect and respond to the leadership that is demonstrated by other members of the team. Remember, we are not the experts, but rather the facilitators. It is best when the role of team leader shifts between different team members. Sixth, we want to build relationships within the team that support shared decision-making. Ultimately, 
the person served has final decision-making responsibility. But hopefully a number of those decisions rely upon others on the team. And since there is shared responsibility, there should be shared decision-making. Seventh, we want to be practical, flexible, and adaptable. In working with the team, we need to be able to let go of preconceived ideas and allow the process of the team to identify best solutions. Eighth and finally, we want to immediately respond to requests for help from other team members. Our ability to help, especially in an emergency or crisis situation, gains the trust of the other team members and gains the commitment of that team member to the process. While all of the collateral resources that we previously discussed are important members of our team, family members are perhaps the most important. The movement to treatment in community mental health facilities has resulted in a heavy burden of care for the families of people with mental illness. The nature of this caregiving role is often not understood by professional mental health workers. Families are frequently excluded from treatment and care plans. The reasons for this include the belief that the individual has the right to a confidential relationship with the treating professionals. Mental health professionals are trained to maintain confidentiality. This focus on confidentiality can assume precedence over other treatment and care issues that may be of greater benefit to the patient. Sometimes, mental health professionals are not skilled in working with families. There are too few instances where families receive the information, education, training, and emotional support that they need in order to facilitate their loved one's recovery. There are several principles that relate to the involvement of family members in the care of the person served. First, we need to coordinate all elements of the services and rehabilitation plans to ensure that everyone is working toward the same goals in a collaborative, supportive relationship. Working together ensures that the goals for care are understood and agreed upon by the treatment team, which includes the family. This will overcome the isolation that is often experienced by both professionals and families. Second, we need to pay attention to the social as well as the clinical needs of the patient. It is insufficient to focus exclusively on medication management. Needs for appropriate accommodation, employment, or alternative occupation, economic support, recreation, and a supportive social network must also be taken into account. Third, we need to pay attention to medication management. We should be alert to the signs of over-medication and to the unpleasant and disabling side effects of antipsychotic medications. There should be regular reviews of the medication with the patient and the family members. Education about medications plus regular assessment particularly in relation to side effects, will encourage compliance, again, with the person served and with the family members. Fourth, we need to listen to families and treat them as equal partners. Relatives of the person served have gained a great deal of experience and have much to teach us as professionals. Their expertise should be acknowledged and valued. We should consult with the family throughout the care program to improve effectiveness, understanding, and empathy. Speaking to families in their homes may help in initiating that, that family contact. Fifth, we want to explore family members' expectations. Expectations concerning the service plan each family member may have different expectations, and sometimes these may be unrealistic, 
and so it's important to explain what the service team hopes to achieve, and there are also expectations regarding the person served. After an episode of illness, family members may expect the person to return rapidly to his or her previous level of functioning. The family may need to adjust their expectations and form new goals. Throughout the service process, family and patient expectations have to be regularly evaluated. Sixth, we want to assess the family's strengths as well as their difficulties. It is too easy to focus on the family's problems and ignore their strengths. Simply staying together constitutes a strength. A major strength is their intimate knowledge of the person served and what they have learned through a process of trial and error. Caring for someone with a mental illness exacts an emotional toll. Anxiety and depression should not be neglected. These symptoms reduce the family's ability to support the person served. Number seven, we need to help resolve family conflict by providing sensitive responses to emotional stress. Anger, anxiety, and guilt expressed by family members should be dealt with in a sensitive way. Anger can usually be reframed as showing concern. Expressions of warmth are encouraged. Recreational activities should be promoted that are likely to lead to family members enjoying things together. When conflicts arise, we need to listen to the differing viewpoints impartially and seek resolution through compromise. Eight, we need to provide relevant information to the person served and the family members at appropriate times. An introductory education program is an effective way of engaging families, but needs to be followed by continuing education throughout the period of treatment and care. Clinicians and families need to appreciate the person's individual signs of relapse in order to bring about an early treatment intervention. Each family has its own concerns which need to be addressed. Number nine, we need to provide an explicit plan for any emerging crises. The family should have access to the treatment team when they know that their relative is in danger of a relapse. A provisional plan, which includes relevant phone numbers of key contacts and services, should be in place. A safety plan is a good tool to use for this purpose. Number 10, we want to encourage clear communication among family members. In some families, members find it difficult to communicate with each other. They may have stopped listening to one another. It is common for the person with mental illness to be left out of discussions. We need to suggest and develop simple ground rules for clear communication and support the family in their efforts to observe them. Number 11. We need to encourage the family to expand their social support networks. Families tend to withdraw from their natural support networks through the burden of caring, shame, or embarrassment. Initially, they may benefit from social interaction through a relative support group or multifamily problem-solving groups. It is important for the family that the caring role does not absorb all of their life and that a balance is maintained. Persons served may be helped to increase their social activity through social skills training, often with the assistance of siblings and friends. And finally, 12. At the end of services, we need to provide the family with easy access to a professional in case of need if work with the family ceases. It is essential to leave the family with a phone number and the name of a person who can deal with any future inquiries. Sometimes a telephone discussion will suffice. At other times, additional services may be required to help the family cope with a crisis or with a change in their life circumstances.
While it is the person serves job to identify who he or she wants to be on the team, it is really our job to facilitate the effect of the effectiveness of the team and the collaborative relationships of the team members. There are a number of qualities that help to make a collaborative relationship work well. First and foremost is the ability to trust one another. The first step in building trust is to say what we will do and do what we have said. Trust is built one interaction at a time and can be lost as a result of one bad decision. Always do the right thing, as trust is built on integrity. Next, we want to build relationships that are built upon mutual respect. It has been said that we get what we give, so the first step in building mutual respect is to give respect to the other members of the team beginning with the person served. We want to remember that everyone has their own experiences and their own expertise. We want to be open to and accept differences of experience and differences of opinion. The third important quality in a collaborative relationship is open, honest communication. I first want to focus on honesty as the next quality really is about open communication. We are only as good as our word. We are only as trustworthy as we are honest. We want to describe situations to our team members as they are, rather than trying to sugarcoat things or describing situations in the best light possible. Fourth, regarding communication, we want to foster relationships where we actually listen and hear what others are saying. I like to say that if you're trying to think about what you're going to say while the other person is talking, then you're not listening. We can use summary or paraphrasing to make sure that we understand what the other person is saying. Another dimension of open communication is that we have to be able to talk about difficult or sensitive subjects. Not talking about things that are difficult only makes them worse. Fifth, we want to foster a belief for ourselves and among our team members that everyone is trying to do what is best for the person served. Everyone wants to help. Be very cautious in attributing motive to what others say or do, as we might be wrong. Try to stay with the motive that everyone is doing or saying what they are doing because they really do want to help. Next is the ability to disagree. We want enough trust in our relationships to be able to question each other's thinking and to disagree with one another openly, but in a way that communicates respect for one another. Disagreement does not have to damage relationships. Respectful disagreement actually helps to build relationships. Next is the quality of shared power. True shared power means that everyone's input carries the same weight and everyone gets an opportunity to weigh in before decisions are made. Ultimately, it is the person served right to make the decisions. Next is commitment. Partnering with others is hard work but we have to hang in there and not give up if we want to accomplish all that we can in working with our client. One of my favorite images for commitment starts with the question, how do you eat an elephant? The answer is, of course, one bite at a time, but you really have to be committed. The next quality is transparency. This means not keeping secrets and not having ulterior motives. We want to be genuine with one another as we work on these relationships. The next quality is the expectation of success. Hopelessness never changed anything. We want to make sure that success is viewed as not only possible, but that it is expected. After all, 
we usually get what we expect. And the final quality that is important in building effective collaborative relationships is a sense of humor and personal humility. In our work with the individuals that we serve, we are likely to work with serious, difficult situations. But good humor can go a long way toward relieving the stress and tension in those situations. We never want to be full of ourselves, but instead be full of the team. That is, promote the expertise and the skills of the others rather than our own. Social science research helps us understand that each person brings a set of biases, values, and assumptions to all situation. Each of us has a map or a mental model inside our heads that creates meanings for the things that we experience. This mental model carries many assumptions, values, and thus expectations. Since it is impossible for one person to absorb all input and still take action, a mental model is developed as a selection process that pulls out specific but limited data. This mental model allows us to make sense of the world by selecting out information based on our knowledge, skills, experiences, and values. We work very hard to match the experience we have with our mental models. We have mental models, for example, for music, for football, for other people, for ourselves, and for collaboration. Often there are commonly shared mental models for more simple concepts, such as a chair or a flower. However, the more complex the concept, the more divergent mental models can be. Collaboration is initially based on individual mental models. For collaboration to become a shared mental model, partners and teams must tease out what a collaborative process entails and what outcomes are expected. Fleshing this out along the way is critical to the process as our individuality mediates our models. Each person will have a somewhat different mental model of how collaboration will proceed. This individual process is complex and partially explains why there are many different realities that simultaneously exist. Shared values and goals are a foundational part of the overarching mental structure that drives collaborative efforts. Therefore, it is important to evaluate personal goals and values and to make them explicitly conscious. This requires the dualistic pursuit of self-knowledge and knowledge of others' mental models. A regular practice step is to be reflective. This requires frequent inquiry to recognize your values and priorities both professionally and personally. For example, do you know what type of interpersonal style you use in relating to persons served and to your colleagues? Do you observe whether your actions align with your values and priorities? Do you know your hot buttons, which is often used to describe a strong emotional or knee-jerk reaction, one that any person can have when perceiving that a key value is being degraded or disrespected. Lack of awareness of these hot buttons or emotional drivers limits the ability to proactively respond to difficult situations in a constructive way. The current context of different mental models of collaboration and status differences between team members combined with the need to communicate regularly to reach agreements reflects the complexity of skill and effort needed for effective collaboration. There are no easy answers or shortcuts. Patience and a genuine interest in self-inquiry are required. Because social services is one of the most gender structured occupations in the United States, gender communication becomes a diversity element critical to understand if collaborative efforts are to be strengthened. Generally, 
men are more task-oriented and women more relationship-oriented. While it is dangerous to stereotype gender communications in absolute terms, ignoring the differences is equally dangerous. Collaboration requires a focus on both tasks and relationships. Understanding this contrast in communication emphasis between women and men can increase self-awareness regarding the assumptions or interpretations we make in our actions with other team members. Learning more about gender communication can strengthen any person's communication repertoire. Gender communication is an example of a social pattern that adds diversity and knowledge to the interaction and thus enhances collaboration. The invisible strengths of cognitive diversity must be optimized. Researchers have noted for some time that a team's cognitive capability is related to its cognitive diversity. Greater diversity can provide the potential for greater capacity for making complex decision where varied interests need to be balanced. Without diverse perspectives, no synthesis can occur and decision quality suffers. An appreciation of cognitive diversity must be put into action if communication is to be effectively focused on true collaboration. However, it takes a conscious effort to optimize diversity. It is said that people like people like themselves. It is natural to be initially more comfortable with people who have similar styles and experience as ourselves. Often in a group situation, comfortable connections are made and group norms are established. But the opportunity to optimize collaboration with different team members is often missed. This lack of seeking diversity of perspectives can unintentionally lead to exclusiveness and diminished use of available resources. This exclusionary practice has been labeled a negative side effect of collaboration. Appreciative inquiry and dialogue are communication methods that can facilitate collab greater collaborative efforts. Appreciative inquiry is a theory and approach used in organizational development to focus on the positive strengths of an organization and the possibilities rather than the problems. Multiple stakeholders with differing perspectives are asked to work together and develop a shared vision, strategy for implementation, and assessment of gains. This communication approach is one of active listening, positive regard for differences, and the belief in multiple realities. Visioning together what would be possible and how to get such improved outcomes is different from a problem-solving approach. Dialogue is another communications process that facilitates thinking and questioning together. In dialogue, conversations focus on surfacing assumptions, goals, and values, and summarizing disparate ideas in search of connections. This type of strategic conversation allows for further exploration and clarification of different vantage points thus allowing for the development of new knowledge. Information sharing is increased and expertise within the group begins to surface, leading to a new valuation of differences as a context for innovation. Few team leaders possess the depth of communication skills required to facilitate appreciative inquiry or dialogue. Adding such a facilitator to our work group at key junctures in the collaborative process could result in powerful and new outcomes. Listening to and, obser and observing team members to better recognize their values, goals, and ways of communicating are critical actions to engage in if mutually beneficial partnerships are to develop. This takes time and effort. Formal and informal interactions can be opportunities for learning about the diversity of styles and perceptions within the team. 
The inevitability of conflict among collaborating parties has been well documented. Despite long-standing concern over ineffective conflict management, it continues to exist. It may be the most critical obstacle to effective collaboration. Many professionals have not been socialized to understand the potential positive aspects of conflict and to recognize that positive affective relationships and conflict are equally important to effective decision making. Conflict resolution is the cornerstone of collaborative success. The nature of conflict, like that of collaboration, is complex. Conflict can both hinder and facilitate collaboration. When using conflict to facilitate co collaboration, it is helpful to distinguish between emotional conflict and task conflict. Emotional conflict centers around relationships between individuals and can evolve from a task conflict. Task conflict centers around judgmental differences about how to achieve a common objective. Task conflict is often easier to address than emotional conflict. A cognitive debate over how to approach a task can facilitate development of a shared understanding and create the necessary perspective for problem solving. Collaborative leaders must be able to facilitate debate over task issues and promote the expression of different perspectives concerned with how problems are defined and approached. If emotional conflict and personal issues surface within the team context, leaders need to be able to redirect concerns away from a personal level to the task issues. When emotional conflict is experienced within a partnership context, it needs to be discussed, not avoided. Specific cues or words that are leading to the conflict are most effective when giving this type of feedback. An example might be to reference a tone of voice or a lack of eye contact. How nonverbal communications are being interpreted and how these message are, messages are impacting the receiver being presented can provide a base for exploring the conflict. Another important consideration for conflict resolution is that conflict is resolved not by one side dominating the other or by compromising, but by creative integration that meets the differing needs of the collaborating parties. Cognitively, rather than thinking of alternatives that lock into either or situations, a collaborative approach develops a synthesis of perspectives to invent a third alternative. This synthesis of perspectives is the desired outcome of collaboration. Unfortunately, conflict resolution is often focused on the single power concept of dominance. Dominance is a victory of one side over another. However, dominance is not successful in the long term for building commitment because the side that is defeated will wait for a chance to dominate. It is an automatic response to use dominant power, such as formal position, when conflict surfaces. Often, this behavior lies outside one's perspective. Dominant power is incompatible with the integration of multiple perspectives, such as in collaboration, which is critical to solving complex problems. Dominance creates a win-lose environment and leads to the persistent creation of unacknowledged, uneven discussions where one side dominates and difference is silent. Collaboration operates on a model of shared power. However, this does not mean equal formal power. Role status is an invisible structure that connotes a formal or dominant level of power which creates a power imbalance between group members. To achieve collaboration, participants must have some form of mutual exchange. It is the task of one negotiating in a conflict to increase his or her potential for success by actively structuring for a more even power base. 
As noted previously, this even power base can develop integrative solutions where everyone wins. This completes our lesson on collaborating with collateral resources. A copy of the PowerPoint slides for this presentation is available in the lesson media section of this lesson. After you have completed this lesson, you are required to complete the attached quiz with a passing score of at least 70% in order to successfully complete the lesson. Thank you and good luck.